Hello and welcome to this workshop that I chose to call Sufficiency. I do realize that perhaps that naming is not entirely transparent, but we can translate it into enoughness. So it's the feeling of being enough, having enough and doing enough. And well, let me just introduce myself in case you're new around here. My name is Katrina Horn and I'm a life coach. And uh, I'm speaking to you from the south of France, but not that that has got any importance whatsoever. I'm just very happy to see you here. So welcome. If you're here live, feel free to participate via the chat. And if you've got any questions, please go ahead and pop them in the chat. And I'll answer them perhaps as we go along. Uh, or if I forget to look in the chat, then um, towards the end, I'll make sure to go over there. I hope you can all see my screen now because I'm going to go very quickly here. And uh, because I've got a lot of content. So um, I'm going to go pretty swiftly and I think that's okay because there will be a replay going out but feel free to do screenshots or take notes if you want to. Um, hello Isabella, lovely to see you here and Robin is here. Wow, welcome, lovely to see you here. Great, so let me just say that you're in the right place if you don't know if you can ask permission if you easily believe your justification, your explanation, or your proof that you need something. So in fact, you're telling yourself, I need something and you believe it. Or if you're thinking, if I don't do it, nobody will. It's all up to me. Nobody ever helps me. It's just easier to do myself. Or if you're just wanting, uh, just wanting it, if you think it's not enough of a reason to ask. And before we dive into some of the content here, I really wanted you to feel into this. And this is why I'm putting on this workshop. Uh, it is because I'd love for you to be able to answer the question. If you could ask anything without there being any consequences, what would you ask? What would you ask? And I think allowing ourselves to go there to the place where we really get super clear on what we would really ask if we weren't afraid of any consequences. And I think that we can really allow ourselves to feel empowered. Also, also I wanted to, or I hope perhaps that via this workshop, you will feel empowered to ask for that thing that you really want if there are no consequences but as we are in the real world there are consequences sometimes but I would love for you to leave this workshop feeling empowered to ask that question not needing a yes asking the question and having it be perfectly okay to get a no All right that is what I would ideally love for you because there's so much freedom in this being able to ask for exactly what you want without being afraid that it might be a no so we're going to dive in why the need to prove to justify or to explain doesn't serve you so we think that we can perhaps persuade people to give us what we want or to be what we want or to do what we want if we just prove it enough, if we just explain it logically, or if we just justify why we want it, we think that is what will sway people to do or to comply to our wishes. Uh, we're going to look into why hyper, um, hyper self-sufficiency doesn't serve you, because we can go into the opposite, like, to me, everything, there's a balance, there's an equilibrium and everything. So not feeling empowered to ask is not ideal and feeling so over empowered that you feel that you don't need to ask because you can just do it yourself. That is what I call hyper self-sufficiency. 
efficiency and that is going a li little bit too far in the other direction so i hope to prove to you that that doesn't serve you either i know that because i have sometimes been like that in my life also how you can ask from a desire energy and how you can let go of the need to control the outcome so whether it's a yes or a no or maybe or maybe how your ask is answered so letting go of all that control and not having the lack of control stop you and I'll even show you how you can at least mm, you can at least influence the the response um, without ever being able to control anything because in life what can we control well not a lot right we really can't control a lot so as long as we're clinging on to the desire for control, well, then we're clinging on, right? And we're not feeling the freedom and we need things to be a certain way to feel good. And that is not what we want. So I would also show you how you can cultivate this feeling of sufficiency. So I'm happy that all of you joined. I can see that more people are joining and you are so welcome here. Welcome again. So let me just start off with very briefly to tell you why we feel the need to, to insist, to justify, to prove, to explain. It's because when we were babies, the louder we cried, the more attention we would get and the more urgent would be the desire for the adults who were taking care of us to find out what it was we wanted, right? If we were just sitting there not signifying anything as a baby, not crying, that was our only way of asking really, well then we wouldn't get anything. So we had to prove as babies somehow that we were suffering. We had to prove that we were suffering enough for somebody to take action, to take action because we couldn't take that action ourselves, right? We couldn't decide what we wanted to eat. We couldn't eat on, on our own. We were so dependent. And I think that this need to prove our suffering, and maybe those are strong terms for you, but that need to show somebody, look, I'm suffering, you need to comply, that is where it comes from, really. Because I, I hope to prove to you that this is not um, an authentic way of going about it, it's not an empowering way, and it will never serve you or the person participating in it. So think of a time when you wanted a new dress, a dessert, and I put in a little provocatively a hug, and that you felt the need to justify this extravagance, because there's a degree, isn't there, when we ask for something. There's something we ask for, and we feel it's reasonable, we feel it's okay, so we ask with a certain amount of confidence, expecting uh, a positive response. And then there's the things that we find more extravagant that we don't really feel perhaps that we deserve. And then suddenly we ask from a different space and that is that space where we feel we need to justify. So a new dress, yeah, I really must have a new dress because I'm going to my niece's wedding and I really need to look good. And she's expecting me to wear this color. And so I really need to go and get a new dress. And that needy energy, I think, takes a lot of the pleasure away from buying the dress, from going shopping and looking, looking at the dresses and trying on the dresses. I think that's really a joy killer when you, when you bring in the need. It's much more fun to say, I so feel like getting a brand new dress. I can wear it for my niece's wedding too, right? So we don't need to justify, we can just have our desire be enough. I desire a dessert, a dessert, sorry. I don't need to justify that, oh, I didn't have a lot of chicken. So now uh, I need to fill up my stomach a little bit more and need the dessert. Uh, I don't know, maybe that's dessert I wrote in here. <laughs> Actually, that's why I'm having a problem. A dessert has just got one S, hasn't it? I'm not sure. I'm a bit dyslexic. I hope you, you forgive me. What I meant is a thing that comes at the end of a meal. So a dessert. Um, we never need a dessert, but we might desire it. And when we think we need it, when we think we need the dessert to feel good, 
that I am talking a little bit to some of those of you who are here because you are doing. Okay, thank you, Robin. Because some of you are here uh, through weight loss and you're looking at this idea of sufficiency through the eyes of wanting to lose weight. So just think of it, if you're looking at whether you should have dessert or not, if you say, oh, I need it, then you must have it. But when you can let it be a choice, when you can allow yourself to think, I could just have this dessert and enjoy it because my desire is enough, it's completely different to when you believe you need it. I need it to fill myself up. I need it because there's a void somewhere. I need this to feel better. I think you get the difference. And I put in this idea of a hug. We need hugs, we all need hugs, right? That's part of, of being human and you don't need to justify it. I need a hug today because I had such a hard day. No, we always need hugs. We always want hugs. We can just say, I want a hug without justifying. Do you get the idea? So we can actually allow ourselves to ask for what we want without justifying, without saying why, because there need not be a why. Us desiring it is completely enough. So how did it make you feel when you asked out of neediness? When you say to somebody, I need a hug, I really need it, or I need a dessert, how do you feel? You're feeling empty, might be feeling undesirable. I put in unloved, needy, certainly unfulfilled and unworthy. Those are the feelings you're feeling when you're speaking, when you're coming from need, when you're coming from that lack, you're looking for something outside of yourself to fill you up. You need it. Also, you tell yourself, you're, you're not feeling good at any rate. I just put in these examples and really feel free to think of, of, think of other feelings that you might be feeling when you ask what is it that you're feeling in the moment of asking what is the energy you're coming from when you're looking to justify or prove your suffering or when you feel obliged to explain you have a certain set of feelings that we often term negative versus when you ask from a pure desire when you can ask from a pure desire you have a different set of feelings completely different. So what I want to move you from or, or have you consider is the feelings you entertain when you're justifying, proving or explaining. Like, let me give you a quick example. Uh, let me just talk about my chateau again. Like there's no way I can justify that I want a chateau. There's no way that I can prove I need it. There's no way of explaining it away, right? I've got a desire to live in a chateau. And if you don't know me, this is news to you, but for everybody else, you must be so tired of hearing me say that. But I've got this desire and I'm allowing it to be just that, a desire. And I'm not going to even attempt to prove that I need it or justify it in any way or feel obliged to explain, not to you at any rate. Sometimes for people, I say, I want to live in a chateau so that I can host retreats, but that's really not the full reason. It's really not an explanation. It's just that sometimes the people we talk to, they need the explanation. Otherwise, they just go, why a chateau, right? But it would really be lovely if we could get rid of that need to explain or justify or prove, right? Also think about if you... If you have a tendency to prove that you, you want something or you need something because you're suffering, then you're really asking the other person to bail you out. You're trying to persuade them to do something for you. And if they don't, what will they feel? They will feel guilty. So it's really lying on a, laying on a big guilt trip for people. Let's compare that to how you feel when you feel desire. Well, obviously you feel desire but you could also be feeling elation, 
joy, you could be feeling generous, you could be feeling fulfilled. Think about all the delicious feeling you could be feeling when you are in desire. How do I feel when I think about my shadow? I feel so good, right? I feel so good because I know that I will be there one day. I know that. I've decided, so I will. So I'm not entertaining doubt on this. We'll come to that later. But I can really allow myself to feel so good, not having to prove, not having to justify, not having to explain, right? I don't need to control all of that. I, need, I don't need even to know how I will be in my chateau. I can start dreaming about it. I can start feeling into it. But there's no way I need to prove or have to sort of manipulate myself into a chateau. And I'm saying all this, I'm talking about all these feelings because we are feeling beings. We think we act on words. We think we react to what people say, but all studies show that we actually react to so much more than the words. And in fact, the words are only 7% of the communication that happens between people. We react much more to the feelings and we pick up on other people's feelings, don't we? I mean, think of all the times when people have said something and you, you've been sort of feeling the opposite, right? But think of a bad actor. When we think people are bad actors, it's because they're sort of faking the feelings, they're pretending somehow. We pick up on that because we've been designed to pick up on other people's feelings because it's part of our survival mechanisms. So we are very, very tuned in to how people feel. So that's why it's so important to be feeling good when you ask something, because that is what people will respond to. They will respond to how you're feeling in the moment when you ask your vibe, if you like, they'll be responding to that much more than to what you're saying. So I put this up very sort of um, very logically speaking, but and of course, uh, there's always sliding limits, there's always some overlay here. But just think of it if you're asking from feeling insufficient, you're asking from a place of unworthiness, of emptiness, of undesirability, of neediness. And that's what people are going to pick up on. So even if they answer positively to your ask, if their response is positive, their experience is not going to be very good and neither is yours because it all comes from a feeling we really don't like. Now, if you, if you ask from a feeling of sufficiency, you're feeling fulfillment, you're feeling enoughness, you're feeling the joy, generosity, elation, love, all of it, right? You're feeling good. All these are positive feelings and people will react to those feelings. So not only... Not only are your chances of being met with a positive response higher, the outcome, how people will fulfill your desire is completely different because it's coming out of those feelings, those joyful feelings. So your whole experience, both for you and for the people you ask, is going to be different, isn't it? Feeling hyper self-sufficient, the feelings connected to that is resentment, like nobody will do this for me, I'll just go and do it myself. That's a piece of hard done by I don't know what the right adjective of that would be, but it doesn't feel good. There's also this question of separation, and I've been thinking about doing something on separation because I feel we don't talk enough about this. And it's really that feeling of a little bit of being I'm, I'm on my own. Nobody understands me. I'm separate from other people. People are so different from me. I can't relate to them. They can't relate to me. I think we need to talk about that a lot more. I mean, you can talk about it with your friends or whatever, but I think we also need a little bit more education on this. So maybe I'll dive into that at a, at a later date, let's say. Also, when you're feeling hyper self-sufficient, you're coming from a place of unfulfillment, right? You're upset. You're asking from that upset. And that is what people are going to react to. 
And there's nothing as unsexy as hyper self fulfillment uh, sufficiency, is there? Because, well, how can you interact with somebody who's so much in love that they're not even asking anymore? You can't. And I used to do that because I just, I was so afraid of being disappointed. Like I wanted to avoid the feeling of feeling disappointed if I asked somebody to do something for me or do something with me or whatever. I was so afraid that they would say, I don't know, or do it in a way that I wouldn't feel good about and that I would be terribly disappointed. So I just self-protected from the disappointment. And I think we all do that sometimes. Instead of feeling the disappointment, you think, oh, much easier just to get on with it myself. Much easier just to do it. Let me just do it, right? I'm sure you've done that too. <clears throat> I think we all, we all do that sometimes, don't we? In little or, or big things. So just think about these feelings. When you're feeling feelings, and we always are, when we're feeling those feelings, the response is going to be conditioned by those feelings. And the way people take action is from feeling those feelings, you're, fe you're feeling that feeling, and then that generates a sort of mirror feeling in themselves. So is that really how you want it? So we've been taught from an early age to manipulate people into doing what we want. We think we have to manipulate them. I really can't think of a better word than that. You can call it influence or, or whatever you want to, but there's really this idea of design and manipulation never feels good to anybody, not for the manipulator and not for the person being manipulated. So how can we do that differently? So rather than manipulate them, through proof that we are suffering, like I'm suffering so much, please do something that will end my suffering. How can you say no to that? You really can't say no to that without feeling guilty, can you? And when people take action out of guilt, I mean, would you want, to, would you want that in your life? I just think that that is so unattractive that I would never entertain that idea I'd rather do without actually than have people help me or do what I would like them to do out of guilt and the more we prove our suffering the guiltier they're going to feel you see what I mean they really have got no choice and you're telling people you've got no choice you can end my suffering if you don't take action I will continue to suffer and that's a, a terrible thing isn't it what a spot to put people in. Think about it, little or small. Don't we all just do it? I mean, we all do it sometimes. Like, think of your husband. Think of your children. Aren't you guilt tripping them sometimes a little bit? I mean, if we're being completely honest here, we all use that tactic sometimes. And I think if we just catch ourselves just before we do it, if we can just catch ourselves, and go to a different place, a different place of asking. That would be so much more fun. Also through logic, like when we try to demonstrate that our desires are completely logical, that doesn't feel very good either because how are people going to respond to that? Like, I don't feel good if I have to explain to people, uh, you need to uh, give me a lot of money because I need it to buy my chateau or I need you to do all this work in my chateau so that people can come and stay. I need that. You need to do this so that I can do that. That is logic. What if we can just say, I desire that. This is what I want. Do you want to come and play? Do you want to participate in that? If you want to participate, what would you like to do? Then people come from a different energy, don't they? They come from what they want to do, not what they they feel obliged to do. And obliging people to do anything has never worked for me. It really never has. Like when I used to be a teacher, um, I don't want to be talking a lot about myself. It's just really to illustrate this, that as a teacher, I used to work with little kiddies 
And I could, of course, guilt trip them into doing their work, right? I could oblige them to, but there was so much more joy in inspiring them to do it. And I think we can really, a different way of saying it is inspiring people to do something with us, to do something for us because they really want to. I think that's so much more, I don't know, life inspiring, like so much more joyful, so much more communicative, inspiring. Well, I don't know what to say, but I really, I mean, I really want to gear my life more towards that. So I'm constantly conscious of what energy I'm coming from when I'm asking people to do something. How can, how can I invite them to do something rather than guilt trip them, really, if you want to look at it very black and white? But then, of course, there are all the degrees in between. When you let them need uh, feel your neediness, who wants to respond to neediness? It's like responding to, I have to, I feel obliged. That neediness doesn't feel good. Right? So you don't want to be asking from that. And you certainly don't want to let them feel the resentment you've already built up because you have been doing all of this on your own for so long. You're really fed up with it and you really want them to do it now, feeling the resentment ahead of time. Like that is really cruel, I find. So we want to catch ourselves before we do it. So to begin with, perhaps we won't catch ourselves in time, but I think if we practice, practice makes perfect. So let's try asking from pure desire. Just let's practice feeling so enough, feeling so worthy that we can have our desires be enough. So when you feel that, when you feel your desires, you're really feeling elation, joy. You're feeling love, generosity, fulfillment. And people want to respond to that. They really want to be in that feeling. They want to be feeling that with you. And that's how you can sort of persuade is perhaps not the right word, but influence them, inspire them really inspire them to come along with you. So not only are you, are you upping your chances of them wanting to, they will also come to it with a much bigger desire than when you guilt trip them into something. So when you ask from desire, it can have you feel very vulnerable because you are in your desire you are, so to speak, defenseless, except if you already feel that you're enough. If you feel your enoughness, if you feel really the joy of being you, feeling that you don't need this to be happy. If you feel you've got so much that you can be generous, you don't need this, that you're already fulfilled. You are so much and you already, have everything you need that you don't need them it will only make you feel better you don't need it it's a little bit like um if you're at a restaurant and you had a gorgeous meal you had enough it wasn't like a heavy meal it's just a very nice meal you feel i'm complete i had sufficient food it was it was nice i enjoyed it i'm good it's that feeling like okay, everything is good in my world. And then the waiter comes along and he says, oh, the chef just prepared these nice little um, creme brulee. Would you like one? And then you think, oh, maybe I actually want one. I don't need it, but it would feel so good just to sink my teeth into that, to taste the flavor of the cream and the vanilla and mm, that would feel so good right that's a feeling of sufficiency that you don't need it but you can choose to have it and it will really be overflow it's really that which has your cup overflow if you see my my parable here if you see that 
you've got so much you can really if you have more it will be even better but you really don't need it so you cannot feel vulnerable if you feel that you're already enough you, you can't be hurt is what i'm trying to say you only feel vulnerable when you feel that you are not enough and you need that so if we have speak in terms of restaurants and dessert you can only feel if you feel empty and you need that dessert to fill you up then that can't feel good it will feel so much better if you come to it from desire from pleasure and you allow yourself that pleasure are you with me so far I know that I'm going a little bit quickly, but then I want to bring us up to a, an exercise that's coming along too. So when you consider, I can't speak anymore. Yes, Isabella's with me, fabulous, great. So if you ask from a place where you feel you already are enough, you feel the joy of being you, you've got so much that can be generous, you're already fulfilled, you'll be able to let go of the attachment to the outcome. In other words, you won't be so upset with a no. Can you see that? You won't feel so disappointed with a no. In fact, you're ready to hear whatever answer there is because you're already good. So in the restaurant, you quite like a dessert, but if there isn't any, that's okay. Do you see what I mean? You already feel so loved. You already love so much that you don't need anybody to fill you up. You've already got enough money. You've got enough for all your needs. You've got so much actually that you can feel generous towards other people and give to to charities, give to people in need. You're already fulfilled. So you don't need this, this entertainment or, or, or that handbag or that sports car. You're already good. If you choose to have it, it's just because it would be fun, right? That is a place you can get to where you would not be disappointed with a no, and where you can let go of the control to, to, uh, of, for the need to control the outcome. So when you feel the need to control the outcome, you're telling yourself that you can only be happy, satisfied and fulfilled if people behave the way you want them to, or they do what you want them to, or they give you what, what you want, or you get what you want, or they are what you want. Or whatever, your happiness or your fulfillment, your satisfaction depends on it. Now it's really when you want to control because it becomes so important to you to control because otherwise you won't be feeling happy, satisfied and fulfilled. So you start controlling yourself, you start controlling other people or you want to control the outcome. And there's no joy in controlling yourself. <laughs> Let me just say that. Controlling yourself is putting a lot of limits to who you are. So when you control yourself, you're trying to control your emotions that cannot be controlled. You can't prevent yourself from feeling the emotion. What you can do is learn how to process your emotion so it no longer feels scary. So that disappointment no longer feels scary. That is what you can not control, but that you can learn to deal with right? You cannot, or please don't attempt to control yourself through stuffing down your emotions or not saying what you think. There are, of course, ways of doing this. There, there are more respectful or disrespectful ways of doing this, but it's just a, a skill set, really. And it's got nothing to do with absolute control. So you cannot control other people because other people will be other people and other people will just do what other people do. They will think what they think. Uh, they will have what they have, all of that. We cannot control them. What we can influence 
It's how we let that affect us, right? That's our window here. But it's all about us and it's not about them. So we can influence how we ask. Do you see what I mean? We can't mm, micromanage them. We can't control how they react. We can't control how they act, but we can influence how we ask. Also, there's no way of controlling the outcome because we can't even know whether it will be a yes or a no. So if we can let go of the need to create a story around what a no means, often we say to ourselves, well, if he or she doesn't want to do that for me, it must mean that he or she doesn't love us or something along those lines. So we make our we make up, I should say, really, a little story of what it means if people say no. So if we go for a job interview, we don't get taken on. We can make it mean that mm, I'm not competent or I'm not qualified or whatever it is. We can make it mean something. And that is really up to us. We can make it mean so many things and we can actually choose what we make it mean, or what I like even better, not to have it mean a lot. <laughs> not to have it mean anything about us, have it mean something about the situation or other people, right? So that feels so much better. So let's get into my exercise on how we get rid of doubt. I'm just checking the time. Okay, we are okay for, for time. So getting rid of doubt exercise in eight steps. So if you want to do this with me right now, you can. You can come back to the, to the replay to do the exercise with paper and pen. If you're driving now, so obviously don't put anything down, but feel free to do this right now or just take notes. I want you to think of a situation you really want to change and to write it down. And I put some of the most common areas of change down here. You can want to change your job, your house, your image, uh, your income, your self-image, your husband's or mother's behavior. But if you really make it about you, something really personal, if you make it really about something that you want to really change, this could be powerful. Because we're going to, to clean up the thinking around it the way we clean up a messy room. So if you could just have in mind that you're clearing up a messy room now. No more, no less. It needn't be a big deal. We're just going to go into what you're thinking and feeling. And it's just like, your brain is just like a room full of thoughts and, and feelings that are floating around. We're just going to get a little bit of order in there. We're just going to tidy up the place, that's all. So think about what you want to change. And if you're here live, feel free to put that in the chat. Be gorgeous for me to know if I had some concrete examples, I could talk to them. Feel free to share if you want to. If it's deeply intimate, then of course don't if you don't feel like it, but feel free to share in the chat. So I trust that you've all got something you want to change. That's why you need to ask, or you don't need to ask, but you want to ask, you choose to ask. And that's what we're going to dive into. Step number two is, how do you want to think of it? How do you want to think about changing jobs, houses, income, self-images, <laughs> husbands or mother's behavior? Write it down. How do you want to think? I want to think that, and I put down a few examples, but again, please try to make it really personal to you. Maybe you want to think, it can be done. I can change this. Or I'll love it. I love changing it or even I'm worthy of it. I'm worthy of this change. And of course, if you're trying to set up boundaries, I think that's a beautiful opportunity for you to really think I'm worthy of changing or setting up my boundaries. So when I say change, it could really be creating something completely new. It needn't be changing somebody or a situation. It could be creating something new it's all the same thing it's asking again right 
So how do you want to think? You could be thinking, uh, I want to think that my mother will feel better once she changes her behavior. I want to think that our relationship will improve. Right? So you will be very sure about why you're doing it. I mean, who wouldn't want a relationship to improve? Even if, it, even if it's good, you can always improve it, right? There's always more. If you come to, to the ask with a desire for your relationship to improve, can you see how different it is than telling somebody how they should behave? I think the energy is completely different. Step number three, sit with the thought of it. I want my relationship with this person to change. Hmm. It can be done. Our relationship can change. You need a little bit of time to sit with the thought so that you can generate really supporting thoughts, really fill it out for yourself. And as you're filling it out with all those thoughts that support it, you'll be feeling some good feelings or emotions, if you like. You'll be feeling good stuff right here. And just ask yourself, well, how would I actually feel if I change my relationship with my mother for the better, my husband, with my boss, with my son? How would that feel? Hmm. How would I feel about it? And write down whatever it is, joy, relief, satisfaction. I am, I'm a big one for satisfaction because it's really our tipping point. When we can go from frustration into satisfaction, everything changes, right? So my feeling, if I'm finding it difficult to think differently of something, I always go to satisfaction because I can feel satisfaction very easily. I can't feel elation very easily. So satisfaction is something I can always come to. Um, so what is your feeling? I wrote down a few examples, but please feel free to make it really personal about you, a feeling that you can really feel, really imagine feeling, because in step four, we'll be amping up that feeling. We'll be magnifying it. So think of a situation in step four where you're already feeling this, whether it was satisfaction, fulfillment, relief, joy, gratitude, whatever it is. What is the situation, the situation where you're already feeling it? You could feel satisfaction about your, your um, qualifications. You could feel satisfaction about your home decor. You could feel satisfaction about um, the love of the relationship you've got with your dog, really. You can feel satisfaction about how you just tidied up that kitchen drawer. You can feel love or joy or gratitude for so many things. What could you be grateful for right now and make it real? Don't say, oh, I feel so grateful that my marriage is okay. What could you really be grateful for? Right? What, what is there in your life that you can feel gratitude for right now? And then just sit with it. Just let it well up in you. Practice feeling that feeling even more. And we can. Maybe you can't right now amp it up. But with practice, I promise you, you can really feel your feelings much stronger, right? You can call them up and then you can feel them to the full. So this takes time. I don't want to be taking up too much of your time now, but if you're already feeling it, kudos to you, well done. Moving on to step five. From feeling that feeling, ask yourself, what is one possible step I can take right now towards changing it? And there will be maybe 10 possible steps, maybe 20, maybe 100. There's no right first step. There is one first step. And it's really how you take it that will make it right or wrong. 
That is your power here. Your power is not in choosing the right one. Your power is how. How do I perform or how do I implement the step I choose to take? So what could you do now? What could you get up and do? What do you feel empowered to do? What will feel good in this energy that you just, you just generate it, this feeling you're just feeling now? What would be a good step to take now? Write it down if you can, if you're not driving. So ask, ask what it was you want, wanted to ask. What is the situation you want to change? What is your ask? Come from that space. So instead of saying, could you fold up the washing and do it and, and put it away, tidy it up. I'm so fed of always having to do it. Right, that guilt trip. You could say, it would be so cool if you put the washing away. It would be so cool. I would really enjoy that. And please don't justify or explain could you put the washing away so that I can uh, cook dinner? Right? We don't need that last bit. We really don't. Let your desire be enough. Just play with it. See what happens. You don't need to justify it. You need, don't need to prove how this is the best solution. Don't need to explain it. Think about going to your boss saying, I'd like a pay rise. Coming from that energy of joy, fulfillment, gratitude, generosity, coming from that feeling is not the same as asking from feeling hard done by, is it? People are so much more likely to respond positively when you come from that place. I'd like a pay rise please. And living in the real world, you might want to say why, but please don't make your why uh, come from an energy of proving. Try and see how you can make that come from a place where I feel so good. This is why. And we could brainstorm on that, of course, together because there's so much possibility here. Also, if you want to change your self-image, ask yourself, what would it take for me to feel beautiful? What would it really take? And it's an ask of yourself here. What would it take? What would it really take? And if you're in that positive energy, maybe you will come up with some very, very fun ideas. Instead of telling yourself, you look dreadful. Right? Actually, I had somebody say to me, I feel disgusted. How can, you, how can you change from that place? It's really difficult. So make it easy on yourself. Come from a place of gratitude gratitude, not necessarily for your body, not for how you feel you are, but somewhere in your life, you've got that access to gratitude. You've got access to some other good feelings. Bring that in here. <coughs> so I'm just coughing because I'm speaking so much. Let's get rid of the last lingering doubt. Remember, we're tidying up all your thoughts and feelings in that mess that's going on here. Let's just put everything in its proper place. If we want to ignore all our doubts and we just sort of want to override them and, and deny we're feeling them, it's just sort of a cosmetic surgery. It's like sugar coating, isn't it? Because if we've got a doubt, we really need to pull it out and take a look at it, right? This is not about sugarcoating life. It's not about living in la-la land. It's about feeling good and asking from a place of feeling good. But let's be aware 
of what could be preventing us because when we know what is preventing us and we can do something about it. So if you've still got some lingering doubt, write down all the reasons why you can't ask. So example, I can't just ask for a pay rise. My boss will think I'm presumptuous. Or if you're thinking, my mother will never change. I already told her not to speak about that. And she, she continually does. I already told her. Or I'm stuck in my house because I haven't paid off the mortgage. Yeah. So all these reasons why you can't ask for a new house. What are those reasons? What is, what is getting in your way? What do we need to put in its proper place? Right. right now it's looming here. It's taking up so much space that we just can't see what's behind it. We need to put it in its right place so that we can see what else is there. We can see what's behind it, right? Because if we take action from the place of, I'm stuck, I haven't paid off my mortgage. Well, what action can we take from there? Well, not a lot. What can we ask from here? Not a lot. So. Let me just point out, this is not a, a step, it's just point out that your boss will think you presumptuous because somewhere inside you, you think that you are being presumptuous. If you were clear that you were asking for a pay rise out of gratitude, out of joy, out of fulfillment, there wouldn't be any presumptuousness in it, would there? So just think, think about this, think of the ramifications, think about what people are feeling and they're feeling it because somewhere inside of you, you are feeling it too. You are feeding that feeling somehow. It's coming from you, right? If you don't believe me, just try it out. Try asking from whatever feeling you want to and see whether it isn't reflected in the other person. Also, uh, your mother hasn't changed her behavior because you've been asking from resentment, need or desperation. If you tried asking from the feeling of gratitude, of desire for wanting a fabulous relationship with her, from a desire of wanting to go and visit her, how would she react? She would react differently, I promise you. I tried it out, right? I tried that with my mother and actually it changed everything. It really did. It's all got to do with us. It starts with us, right? It really does. So other people have moved without having paid off their mortgages. How did they do that? If you allow something to be possible, then you can start looking at the possibilities Right? If you tell yourself right off the bat, uh, it can't be done, well, you'd be right. If you tell yourself it can be done, you'd be right too, because it all depends on how you think. It really does. And what the energy is you're coming from. I mean, if you phoned up your bank and said, uh, yeah, I haven't paid off my mortgage and now I want to move, you might get a different response from how, how can I remortgage? How can I move my mortgage to a different house? How can I? It's completely different. People will react differently, believe me. So if you're willing to admit that, write down all the reasons why you can ask. So we've worked on our feelings and now we are supporting our feelings with some good reasons, right? We are supporting our feelings with supporting thoughts. So you ask because you choose to. You don't ask because you need it or so, so that somebody can fix something for you because you don't need that. So write down why you chose to ask. I chose to ask my mother for this change so that our relationship would be improved. I mean, who could argue with that? Not even you can argue with that. Right? So what, how can you support the idea of your ask? Your reasons why you can ask? 
why you choose to ask. It would be so fun doing this with somebody is one of my examples. Or I always knew there was a better way of doing this. I just couldn't see it. And this has happened so often to me. Like if I get off my high horse and I actually ask from a different place, that's so much more possible. That's so much more that I hadn't even imagined. Like this weekend, we decided with Manuel, my husband, to do something about our front garden because we've had a terrible drought and lots of the plants have died. And I thought, okay, I, I must cut some of these down. And then I told my husband, oh, um, I think I'll just cut these down. And then I got the idea, what if we just got rid of it? What if we just pulled it up? And so I asked Manuel, could you just pull it out? And he just did. He just got her pickaxe and dong, 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 and it was pulled out, like so easy. Had I been working from a, a, a former paradigm, I would have been onto him saying, could you do something about these, these uh, dead plants? Could you just do something? Could you just do something? I really want you to do something. I feel so bad that nothing has been done about these plants. Do you see how different that is? It really is. And now I feel so good about our front garden because it, if, it, if I can't say it looks good, at least it, it looks less dead now. So <clears throat> uh, that was just an example of seeing a new way of doing something that you hadn't even thought of because people are inspired to take action because you inspire them. And when you inspire people, there's no telling what, what magic they'll operate. Try it out. So. Uh, imagine asking for money, either your bank or your employer, from a love of money. Just think about, I love money. The more I have, the more I can give. Can I have a pay rise, please? I, how fantastic does that feel? It really does feel good. I promise you. So to sum up, try and get into a good feeling place. Clear your mind of any doubt, anything that would prevent feeling good, and then just cultivate the belief that you can ask, that you're allowed to ask, you've got permission to ask, and that you don't need it because you're a big girl, you are in charge of your life, and you can do anything you want to do. Do you see what I mean? I would really love for you now to think about the question I invited you to think of in the beginning. What would you ask if there were no consequences? What would you ask? And then instead of thinking, being afraid of the consequences, what if you could allow yourself to be okay with any response? What if that was the right? What if you could trust yourself so much that you knew no matter the response, I can feel good. I am sufficient. What would that change in your life? So if you want to dive deeper into all this, that I feel so useful for life, when you feel sufficient, when you feel all that enoughness, when you feel that there's nothing you need to be, do, have, anything that you need to change, that everything is good the way it is right now, when you can feel that, then anything you want in life gets to be so much more enjoyable and you don't attach to it. You can let go of it, you can feel the desire and have that be okay. So if you want help with that, if you want to be able to feel the ease, if you want to be able to take your desires so seriously that you feel able to ask, but ask from that pure place of desire. If you want to let go of the control of, of the outcome, if you want to stop micromanaging the people, the situations, if you want to just let go and feel ready for whatever the outcome, trusting that it will be good, I would love to help you. Um, and you can actually book 
uh, free consultation with me should you wish so. So that is one option. If you want to look at how coaching could help you, and I like to talk about the design of our lives, and it's really about designing our lives rather than reacting to it. I can help you. So please go ahead and book a session with me. Um, it's all tailor-made to you. You can come with your ask and we can dive into that, or we can have a sort of general run through of your of where you are at right now in your life and what you would like to change, knowing that you can change it from a good feeling place. It really is possible. So I'm just getting hold of my link to my scheduler, which I will put in the chat. And I'll also include this link in the email that goes out after this session. So um, we'll be uploading it to YouTube so that there will be a translation for all of you who are not native English speakers, because maybe I'm speaking a little bit quickly. So you can watch the replay with the subtitles, should you wish. Otherwise, I'm here and I'm ready for some coaching, should you want some. Or just talking about what your ask is, really, what you'd love to be able to ask, not fearing the consequences, but feeling so confident that there's nothing you couldn't ask for. I mean, imagine this, feeling that life is so open that you're able to ask for anything, really, anything you want. You can go ahead and ask for that. No need to justify, no need to prove. You don't even need a reason to ask because your desire is reason enough. So let me know if you've got any comments, if you've got any questions, anything you don't agree with really, or anything you didn't understand. I'm here and I'm available. Should you need any help? Or you can just hop along and book a consult with me. Tell me if the link is working. So please go ahead. I can see some people I know here and other others I don't really know. Thank you for people putting on that camera. That just feels so good. So nice to see people here. And you really can, well, I hope I made it clear. I'm not sure, but trying to control our emotions is really not possible. We can direct our thinking. That's the only option we've got. We can't say, I don't want to feel the disappointment. We can go in and direct our thoughts to where we want to be thinking or to what we want to be thinking. And that's what I liken to tidying up a messy room. Like we can generate thoughts that we can put right in front of us, our go-to thoughts. And these are not affirmations. It's not an affirmation saying that, when I ask for something, I always get it. I mean, that is, that is irrelevant, really. That is not how you work your mind. That is saying something, and it looks a little bit like wishful thinking. But um, so I don't find that very useful. What I find useful is to work on a thought. So we might have a doubt that we want to identify. And these doubts can often be very sneaky. So we need to ferret them out. We need to go and have a look at what actually am I thinking? What is coming up for me? And you can do that through journaling or if you book a session with me, then I can, I can quickly tell you what thoughts you're having around something. And when you look at the thought, when you've got the thought here, sometimes we can just see straight away, oh, that's the most ridiculous thought I ever had. And then we can change it. Or we can question it. If it seems like um, a reasonable thought, then we can go in there and challenge it. And I think it's when we challenge a thought and we change the thought gradually into something that supports what we want to think, something that changes our belief, that is when we become very powerful. So when we believe that actually everybody's well served, 
by whatever action it is you want it, whatever change it is you want it. If you believe your boss will be well served by giving you a pay rise, well, then you're much more likely to ask for the pay rise from a, from a good feeling place. If you think he's actually winning too, it's a win-win situation. If you come to your ask with that idea in mind, well, your chances of success are so much higher. If you don't get the pay rise, well, then it doesn't really mean anything about you. You don't have to tell yourself that, oh, I can't be qualified enough or he doesn't like me. You can let it be something only about him or the situation or not have it mean very much at all. So I'd love to hear if you've got any thoughts on this. Okay. Okay, you want to find the right partner. Of course you do, who doesn't? Yeah, but think about when you meet people, Jacqueline. And I don't know whether I'm pronouncing your name okay, but how, thank you, how are you meeting other people? Are you coming to them as this woman who knows she's so desirable? She looks fantastic. She doesn't need anybody because she's taking care of all her needs herself. If she wants somebody, it's just really to have somebody to feel even better with. It's just for somebody to, to share in the fun. If that's how you're meeting people, first of all, you'll be meeting a different kind of person than if you're coming saying, I need somebody who will love me. So no, not only are you meeting different people, you're also sending out a different message. Because remember, it's people react to our feelings. People respond to how we feel, not only to our words. They respond to how we feel as we say it. That is how they respond. So the more confident you can be that you are enough, that you are sufficient as you are. You don't need any person to compliment you or compliment you either. You don't need that person. If you want a partner, it's because you want one. And you don't want this partner because there are many other partners out there. There are so many possibilities and it's so fun to go and meet some of them. Do you see what I mean, Jacqueline? It can be enjoyable. Okay, so there's a mortgage concern. My concern is I want a house, but if I lose my income, I don't know if I will be able to pay the mortgage. Yes, of course, Yolanda, of course. So you want in some way certainty that you will never lose your income. How can you be certain of that? You can't. You really can't. There is no certainty in life. If we want certainty before taking action, we will never take action. So I would start having a belief. I would start building a belief. I would build a belief that other people have lost their incomes and been able to find another source of income. So the idea is you can lose income and find another one. I would build the belief that if other people can do it, I can do it. If other people can generate income, I can generate income. You might be thinking, I've only generated income in one way in my entire life. So I wouldn't know how to generate any other income. But then that's just a thought. That's just a belief. And we can change the belief. You've got the belief here, perhaps. I mean, I don't know. But you could perhaps have a belief saying that I've got this income now. If I lose it, I won't be able to generate another stream of income. And that, that thought is hiding all the other possible thoughts behind it. 
So we've got this big thought up here and it's sort of blinding you. You can't see what's behind it. But there is so much behind it. There's so much possibility. And when you think of it, nobody's ever sure that they will be able to maintain their income. Nobody. I'm not sure. Right? Nobody's sure. So there's probability. How high is the probability that I will lose my income? Maybe you want to play with that. But I really like if you feel emotionally safe enough to go to the worst possible nightmare scenario. So I've got a new house. I've got a gorgeous new house. I've got a mortgage and I lose my income. What then? What then? If you can allow yourself to go there, then you've really done everything. I mean, it won't ever get any worse than that because you'll be feeling the feelings of panic, perhaps, of desperation. <laughs> you'll be feeling unsafe. But then there are so many ways of feeling safe. You just have to pick another one. Right now you've paired Steady income with safety. And now you're seeing um, getting a house, paying a mortgage as not being safe, insecurity. But all these things you can group differently. You can say, I'm so safe because I own my home now. A landlord can't put me out. I'm so safe. If I lose my income, I would just generate another income. And of course, this is where coaching comes in because it really is life-changing because when we can believe that we are able to generate that other income, when we are able to create safety elsewhere, when we are able to generate all those feelings that have us feel good and feel safe, but well, then nothing can really stop us. And I think getting the mortgage for your house is just your first step. And that first step, when you take it, that will have you see what else is possible. That would just generate so much more inspiration for what you desire. It will really take you to new heights. It's about taking the first step, really. And obviously you could need coaching for that. And that is perfectly okay. Perfectly okay to, to ask for help. I, sorry, I just, I just muted you, Isabella. I'm sorry. So if you want to speak, you can unmute yourself, of course. So life is uncertain, but I can make it. Yeah, I think my what ifs are the problem, yeah. So who did you ask about starting a nonprofit? Who did you ask? And what and do you believe their answers? I was told I need to buy the house and car first. I would really challenge those thoughts. I mean, this sounds like a I don't know where that could be coming from, but I would definitely question that. I'd really love for you, Yolanda, to to make an appointment with me because I really think that we can do something here. We can do something massive. We need to clean this up, All right? <laughs> there might be a little bit of mess going on in your room here. Let's clean it up together. Please go, if you've got the link, uh, please go and book a session or, um, yeah, okay, lovely. Brilliant, love it, yeah. You really don't need to stay in confusion, you know. You really can clean up your thinking. And the advantage of that is that once we clean up our thinking, and by cleaning it up, I just mean putting it in its right place because there's always doubt. But we must just learn to put doubt in its right place. It's not a question of, of having doubt sort of drown you. And it's not a question of never having doubt, like pretending doubt doesn't exist. It's about 
putting it in its right place is really the best description. We don't want, we, we don't want doubt to overcloud our judgment. We really don't. We want to, to be able to think clearly uh, because we're not being influenced by a desire to avoid feeling. Sometimes we don't take action because we want to avoid the feeling. I mean, I think always actually. We don't want to perhaps deal with the consequences, but if we can just take it apart, tease it apart and really allocate a space for everything, get everything into proportion. That really feels so good. It, it just feels like so much clarity and the decisions you, you make from that place of clarity where everything in its right proportion, it feels so good. Okay, oh well, I'm so happy you could make it Isabella. Bye for now. Right. Yeah, of course Yolanda. There's so much gorgeous stuff we can dive into in our session together. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, thank you for sharing all of that. It's lovely. It's really, it's lovely. Yeah, so I was saying, um, having doubt like in the first, first seat, having doubt in the driver's seat is not going to take you anywhere where you want to go, is it? I mean, you're most likely getting stuck in your parking space. Yeah. Right. Who's going to take action on doubt? I mean, it, it depends on how much doubt, right? It really depends on the probability. If you think I'm going to buy a house, take, it, take on a mortgage, but I'm probably going to do something wrong and I will lose the house. Well, you're never going to buy a house, are you? You're never going to ask for a mortgage. How, how big are the chances of that? So I don't know where you live here, Londa, if it's in uh, Europe or in, the, in America, South America, North America, but you know, there are, I don't know about any other countries, but in these countries, there are regulations in place, like that safeguard us. So we can really sometimes allow ourselves to feel safe. And I think that's really all we want. We want to feel safe and secure, don't we? So anything that has us feeling massively insecure will not spur us onto action. But I, I can only speak for myself and I didn't understand this when I was young, but my ability to be able to feel my emotions and not be afraid to feel them has really allowed me to take consistent action towards my dream. So obviously my dream has changed along my life because my first dream was to emigrate to London, to go to music college, to work with the best teachers and everything. And I did that. And then my dream was to move to Paris and I did that. And then my dream was to, to move to the south of France and I did that. And now my dream is to have a chateau. And I haven't done that yet, but I know I will. I really am, I'm not, well, of course, sometimes I doubt but my doubt is over here in a little corner. And right in front of me is, oh, my shadow. The people I will meet through getting the shadow, the people I will meet in my shadow. Oh, I'm so inspired by that. And here's a little bit of doubt. Oh, oh yeah, that's a doubt. Oh, let me not focus on that. Let me just focus on my belief. And let me just always, support that belief, right? I don't want to be working on beliefs that don't support my desire, do I? So maybe you've got some beliefs that we need to shift and that is Jacqueline, where you can use this, you can really shift your beliefs. Maybe you've got a belief like that says, um, I'm not thin enough for somebody to love me or I'm not thin enough to be beautiful. I mean, looking at you, I know that's not the case, but um, if you've got a belief like that, you can really question it. You really can. Do I want to believe that? Is it serving me? And the question is no, because when you come 
to an encounter with a possible partner, if you're not feeling good about your self-image, this is what he'll pick up on. And he doesn't pick up on you not feeling good about your self-image. He picks up on your self-image not being good. So we can't control what other people think. We can only control, or I like to call design or direct how we think and feel about something. And with a little bit of help, we can actually learn it. And it's not difficult. It's really just building new beliefs. It can be done. Lots of people have done it. And not only do you get uh, to what you desire, you get to feel good doing it. And what could be better really than feeling good? I don't know. I can't think. I mean, to me, life is about meeting people and feeling good. Feeling inspired and people inspire me, places inspire me, uh, I inspire me. I mean, there's so much inspiration out there. And the more I feel inspired, the more I feel that I'm being all of me. Like I've not allocated one part of me to stay hidden. I'm bringing it all out into the light. So I don't have to control anything about myself because it's all there. Do you see what I mean? And I think that's really part of the joy of life to me. But let me know if you've got any questions, if you've got a particular situation, um, or you can take it to one of our sessions. So a session with me, a consultation with me is not necessarily only coaching. Uh, we could also dive into what you could be doing. So you'll be leaving with some very tangible first steps that you could take towards changing what it is you want to change. Bye-bye, Robin. Lovely to see you here. And if you've got nothing else to add, I will be saying goodbye and hopefully connect with you either by email, in a session, or in our next workshop together. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you for being here. You are so welcome, Rebecca. Lovely to see you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Maria. Bye.